Now we're going to get into a really fun subject, statistics. <laughs> Don't make a mad rush to the door. If we go a little long here, I apologize. <laughs> We're supposed to be done in 15 minutes. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but um, this if you have to leave, I understand. You will not be insulting to me if you have to, to leave. But um, this one is a little heavy. I intentionally put this one in this period so that we wouldn't try and do something after. I wanted to have the gaps. We're going to end on this one because otherwise your brain cells will just explode. So um, I just wanted to make this um, really clear. This one is fascinating. You want some evidence now, not just from biblical. You want some scientific evidence about the word of God and about the creation days. I'll give you scientific statistical analysis. Are there ways that we can know for sure that the Genesis days are actually literal and historical 24-hour days? Is there a way of knowing it? Outside of what I've told you about the Hebrew language, is there a way to actually show it? Yes, there is. The Bible is rich collection of a variety of literary styles. Most of the Bible is written in poetry. God is poet. But that does not mean that everything is just allegory. Um, it consists of historical narratives. There are historical points to it. There are things of poetry. Psalms have a lot of poems in it. And you find poems in other sections. Um, there's the law itself in the Torah. Uh, you have the apa, um, apa, apa, I can't even say the word, uh, apa, that word. <laughs> Apocalyptic. Here we go. Thank you. See, even then I struggled. There's letters that are written, epistles and letters and things. Now, here's what's interesting. In talking with, with rabbis and stuff, the ancient Jews never had a problem distinguishing if something is a historical narrative or if it's to be taken as an allegory. They never have a problem with that. So the question is, how do, the, how do Jews know this? How do they know when they're reading something out of the, the Tanakh, their, their Old Testament, how do they know when something is historical as opposed to allegory? Well, there is a way, and I'm going to show you how this, this all works. There is a way of doing it. Today, people question the first 11 chapters of Genesis, trying to meld the biblical narrative with modern science, as we've been talking about. Well, what has emerged are three distinct views of creation. First of all, either the creation account is outdated, it's a mythical story from the ancient world, and it's riddled with errors and mistakes. It's not God-inspired. It's either that. There's your atheist view. Uh, second, uh, another view people can take is Genesis account is seen, uh, is seen as poetry, that it should be read as lit not be read as literal history, but as a fairy tale. Uh, the days of creation representing long periods of time, um, perhaps billions or millions of years, whatever. That's what we've just got done sort of discussing and showing that can't possibly be. Or the third one is, it is a literal historical narrative that God created the earth in, in creation in six 24-hour days with one day of rest, that he is supernatural and he is not confined by the laws of science um, and he could have created everything if he wanted in a millisecond. But he didn't do it in a millisecond because he wanted to set up the principle for having a week. So, I mean, he could have just instantly everything been done, but he didn't do it that way. He has a plan for everything. Now, the view number one, like I say, the first view there, atheist view, that's totally in conflict with Christianity. We're, we're not even going to go there. A um, little joke here on a, um, after Eden cartoons. Those are fun. Uh, this morning I'll be reading the creation story from the book of Genesis and then refute it with the latest findings from secular science and then back that up by quoting theologians that don't believe uh, the Bible anyway. <laughs> so um, that's sort of what goes on in some places. What's the difference between a narrative and poetry? Okay, we sort of talked about this, but we're going to make this really clear. A biblical narrative, a historical narrative, is a fact-telling telling story, and they usually contain three elements. There's almost always in a historical element, they're going to have a time factor, a time, a place, some circumstance. They're going to describe that perfectly. Second, you're going to have sets of characters. You're going to have names. You're going to have nouns, characters, and stuff. Third, you're going to have a sequence of events. Things happen in sequence in historical narrative. Now, that's not always true in poetic these, these are factors for narrative that you find. Poetic ones will be a little different. And I know many of you are writing this down, so I'm just pausing here for a second to give you a chance to do that. Um, but that's the thing for a biblical narrative, historical narrative. Now, what's the opposite of that? 
Well, the opposite of that is biblical poetry. Poetry, there's several divining features. Now, remember, we're talking ancient Hebrew, so it's a little different. Organized and labeled verse. Here's some examples of biblical poetry, not taken from Psalms necessarily. Numbers, chapter 23, Balaam's oracles. The story of Balaam, the guy with the donkey, talking donkey, he goes into a poem as he's describing things. Uh, Deborah, in chapter 5 of the book of uh, Judges, after the battle, um, she writes a song, and she sings a song, which is a poetry. Um, it's based on a historical thing, but it's, it's a poetry. Then we have the songs of David. Oh, my gosh, we have too many to count here. Psalm chapter 22 has some. Psalm 119 is a beautiful one. Psalm 136, and there's so many we could go to. But Biblical poetry is organized and it's labeled in verse. Like we do poems in verse and songs in verse. We, we do that. That's one thing. You don't see that in historical narrative as much as you do in poetry. Second, the distinct style. Now, Hebrew, this is not English, this is Hebrew. Hebrew poetry does not necessarily possess meter or time like American poetry does. It, it does include similar sounds rhyming words and stuff. It will do that in arrangements of words. That's true. You see that in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. Uh, one key feature used in the Bible is parallelism. Um, the book of Daniel is full of parallelism. If you don't understand what this is, you can talk to me afterwards. It's fascinating. Matthew uses this also in, in some aspects. Other styles are um, symmetry. There is balance. It's like you're writing music. Uh, poems are. Um, and poems are highly structured, literal, um, and profound ideas. My daughter, Heather, my oldest daughter, when she was still in high school, got published a book of poetry where it's all in rhyme and system and time and stuff and words sounding, so, you know, classic poetry. That's not historical narrative. A third thing about biblical poetry, the goal is to engage the reader's five senses and emotion. Those of you who have ever written poetry or love reading poetry, is this not true? You want the reader to be able to express it, to feel it, to understand it, to smell it, to see it, to hear it symbolically. That's the poet's greatest wish, is that you get so wrapped up and engrossed into it that you actually become a part of it. That's their main goal. It's not a historical story. So that's what we see with these poetry sections of Bible. Now, here's the question. Is it possible to categorize in a biblical text into one of those two modes? Well, it must be or I wouldn't put the slide in there. How many times do I keep saying that? Yes, it can be done. Now, some areas of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, are easily identified as historical narrative. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, David sinned with Bathsheba. When he was walking out on the roof of his house one night, instead of being at the battlefield, and he's walking around, he sees this foxy, cheeky babe over there taking a bath. Um, that's a historical narrative. Everybody who ever reads the story knows this is not David talking about poetry. It's David lusting after a, a woman. That's what it is. Um, when we have um, the, um, the death of King Ahab, that, that's a historical thing. So these things are described. They're not poetical. You can tell this. Scholars call such things genres. That's the word that is used for this. Um, scholars examine these different categories, and they call them genres. And well, I'll use that term a couple times here. A genre are common throughout the Old Testament, and ancient Jews never, ever had difficulty distinguishing between this type of genre or this type of genre. They always seem to know. But how could they so easily, hearing a scroll being read, how were they able to pick it up? Oh, this is historical. Oh, no, this one is, is poetical and allegory. How did they do it? Well, let me give you the best answer. And by the way, you can read this. Um, you, you can download his work, Dr. Stephen Boyd. Uh, he's a biblical scholar who worked on the Comprehensive Aramaic Lexicon Project, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati. He I'm using him. There's others who have done this, but he put it in the most understandable method um, I've ever seen. And it is in the back of a book called Thousands, Not Billions. He was devoted a whole chapter in here talking about this, and he explains this um, in chapter 10 of this book. But you can download for free right on the Internet his works and actually read his papers, which um, since the Internet came out, it's really easier to do it that way. 
but this is what he discovered. Now, this is a guy, you understand from his credentials here, he is like a world's expert on ancient Hebrew. And he, in studying and writing a lexicon, English dictionary uh, composition for the Hebrew language, he started noticing, and this is a problem that always puzzled him too. So how were they able to do it? And he explains how this is done. He discovered while he was setting up a statistical analysis of the Old Testament Hebrew, that he came across the way this was done. And others have verified this. He says that the clue to dealing with Hebrew, um, to understand this, is to understand the Hebrew verb forms. The verbs in ancient Hebrew will tell you if it's historical or allegory. Now, ancient Hebrew is a little different than English. So you're going to have to bear with me here for a little bit. The goal now, what we're really focusing on, is the goal of Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. Is it historical or is it poetical? Is it allegory? That's what we're focusing on. So as we go into this, let's see what he, well, others have found too. Dr. Boyd, I'm using him as an example because he wrote the clearest papers I said on this. He examined the verbs and he found out there's a type of verbs that are called finite verbs. Finite verbs have different forms or what we call inflections for persons. I, you, he, they. Some are gender, uh, gender related, uh, masculine, feminine form of verbs. There are numbers, there are plural verbs, there are singular verbs. So he started just ch chopping and categorizing all these different types of verbs. It is well known to biblical language experts that biblical Hebrew has four finite verbs. There's only four what we call finite verbs. They're called imperfect, perfect, wa perfect, and preterite. Those are the four type of verbs that you find in ancient Hebrew of the finite verbs. There you go. Now, what are these? Imperfect verbs indicate a past action or state an incomplete or a continuous task. Sort of sounds like more historical. Perfect verbs, forms used in a single event in the past, which is being contrasted to main characters. That sounds more like poetry. Wa perfect, used for repeated or habitual actions in the past. And then you have what's called preterite. These are the key ones. They express directly past tense and past actions, historical things. So when you start seeing a bunch of preterites, you know you're reading something historical. Not if you're reading perfect verbs, you're reading something more poetical. And I'll explain this here as we go on. Because finite verbs are countable, you can sit down with the Bible, and count how many with the ancient Hebrew language, you can count the actual number of these verbs and put them in those four categories, which is what he did. And because of this, you can use a st statistical analysis to study these and categorize them. Now, through the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the, whole, of the Old Testament on what to write, they didn't just wake up and say, oh, I'm going to write a Bible today, or write a book of the Bible. The Holy Spirit guided them on what to write. The original readers never had, the ancient Hebrews never had a problem distinguishing between historical narrative and poetry. They just don't have this. How is it so evident? It's because of the verbs. For instance, whenever Paul wrote about Adam, every single case in the New Testament, Paul writes, writes about Adam, and he's quoting something from the Old Testament. He's always placing him in the historical narrative. Thus, Adam was a real person. That's what that is saying. Paul, every time refers to him, he refers to him as an actual person. But several historical events written in the Old Testament are written in both narrative and poetical styles. Now, we called that, because it's two different things, paired texts. So we do see this. Here's some examples of paired texts. We're going to have the same story from two different sides, one historical, one poetic. The creation account in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 which is what we've been talking about. I've been telling you it's, it's historical narrative. Yet, there's a creation account found in Psalm 104. That's a poetical form of it. It's talking about it through a poem. You have the flood, Genesis 6-9. Uh, there's a parallel with that. There's the history of uh, Israel, Psalm 105-106. Uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. I do believe that's a historical thing. I talked about it a little bit last night. Exodus chapter 14 has it. You get to Exodus 15, you have Miriam singing a song about it. That's poetic. They're both talking about the same event, but you can see very e clearly here in just two chapters, this beautiful historical story 
than the poetical one. And you get the same thing with Barak and Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5. In chapter 4, you get the historical account of the battle. Chapter 5, Deborah sings a song about it, and she writes a poem about what just took place. Now, using these, you can see one, two, three, four, five stories. Let's just look at these for a second here, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Here's a chart with these stories. If you look at the bottom of the chart, down here it has the these different biblical stories that I just told you, where they're found. We were just talking about the Exodus one, so here's Exodus 14, it's this column here. Exodus 15 is this column here. Judges 4 is this one, Judges 5, you see how this goes, and so forth and so on. Now, when we look at this, notice that there's different columns in this column graph, and they are colorized to help you see this easier. Uh, the preterites, historical verbs, just to make it very simple, historical verbs are appearing in green. The imperfect, imperfect verbs are the ones that are more poetical. They're used for that type of thing, contrasting certain things. Then you have what's called the perfect verbs, which appear in yellow, which sort of go uh, more to the poetic, but not always. Um, and then you have the wa perfect, which are pretty much, they don't do much you can see on either one. You don't get really much contrast there. But the, the uh, preterite verb compared to the imperfect verb, look at the differences. Now, what's Exodus 14 was the story of the flood. I'm sorry, the story of the Exodus crossing. The Israelites being destroyed and everything. Historical. Exodus 15 is a song about it. But look at... The amount, these are the numbers, uh, relative frequency that you see of the preterite verb. Look how high this is. It's over 55, 56% of that account has that type of verb in it. How many of the imperfects? Less than 20%. You get to the next chapter, the song, look how this changes. There's very, very few preterite verbs, but look at what happens to the perfect and the imperfect, how high they go up. They go close over 40%. This is history. This is not. Let's go to Judges, chapter 4. Chapter 4 was the story of the battle, the historical account. Look at how many preterite verbs there were. Look at how many imperfect and perfect there were. You can see this is historical because this is so high in the percentage. You go to Judges, chapter 5, the song, Deborah's song, it's poetical. Look at the amount of verbs here. Preterite verbs, they're practically non-existent. Yet, you start seeing some imperfects, and wow, look at all the perfect verbs popping up on that one. See how this is going? So by studying these verbs like this, we can start to see which way, by, by just the frequency of the verbs, gives us an idea of the story, of how it should be taken. So, in these examples, preterite verbs form historical narratives. Preterite verb, history. Imperfect, perfect verbs, poetic. And it's just not, well, Michael, there's a lot more stories than five. Yeah, there are. And Dr. Boyd examines and, and puts into this 96 stories overall. But I'm just showing you this just to get you started so I don't lose you right away. But this bar graph is showing what we're talking about here. You'll notice if you have a lot of green, high in frequency, you've got a historic story. If you don't, if you have mostly red and yellow, you have a poetic story. Now, notice I have not given you really the Genesis 1 too much on here. We haven't talked. But here's Genesis 1 right there. Look how Genesis 1 is. It's about 68%. Historical. What about the other ones? The other verbs here, very low, not even 20%, maybe 20% total. Big difference. As Jews read or hear this, they catch these verbs. They understand this, and they know, okay, look at the amount of preterite verbs. This is telling me that this is Historical. Oh, there's not many preterite verbs. There's perfect and imperfect. Okay, this is poetical. Because here is the Genesis account written as a song in Psalm 104. Look at how this is. There's hardly, pre hardly any preterite. Almost everything is imperfect, meaning that's a song. It's a, they're not taking it as a historical fact. It's just taking the story and building a song around it. This chart shows tremendous evidence when studied using statistical analysis. The Genesis account I just showed you fits the historical narrative. I just gave you scientific evidence to support that. 
you catch that? Scientific evidence to support that. On the other hand, the creation account, like I say in Psalm 104, fits the poetic form because of its high use of imperfects. To the Hebrew people, when they read it, they see all these imperfects and hear all these imperfects. They're like, okay, this is a story. It's based on a true event, but they've made it into a poem. So it's not to be taken as a historical narrative. Psalm 105, an account of Israel's history, is interesting because it contains a consistent pattern of preterite and imperfect verb usage. This is a paired text. This one's really interesting. Um, in his studies of the Hebrew Bible, Dr. Boyd took 97, I'm sorry, I said 96 before, 97 passages of the Bible and studied them using this system. And in this, he categorizes all these things by the verbs uh, and the number of times that they are used. And he builds a system for 97, I, I, I hate that the word random appears in here, because as we said last night, there is no random. There was always, there, okay, there had to be 97 stories that he's somewhat familiar with. It's not random, because there's something about that. But anyway, he took 97 stories as best as he could do at random and formed this thing. For instance, in the narrative passage of Genesis 31, Boyd counted 70 preterite verbs out of a total of 153. So if you figure out the ratio, that's 70 divided by 153, that's uh, 0.458, or roughly, we can just say 46%. 46% are of these um, preterite to finite verbs. So this is what he did. He just counted them up, and he did ratios. That's how he did this thing. That's why he came up with the numbers. And he formed this chart. Now, I want to uh, beg your pardon for part of this, because this is actually from the first paper I downloaded on him. And uh, I was before I ever thought I would use this, I started making notes on it. And you can see some of my pencil marks where I was writing notes on the sides of the paper. <laughs> so that's why those lines are there. Just ignore those. But notice that we have a narrative passage here. That's historical. Then we have the poetic. So two different categories of these texts. Now, over here we have diamonds. Here we have squares. Each one of these diamonds, they're set up, there's 97 of these things going across. And these are the passages, so like the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. It's, he's just randomly putting these things together. Now, as he did these passages, of all these different 97 passages, he counted up the preterite to the imperfects, etc. He did this counting thing that I just showed you and made ratios. That's what you see here. Here's the ratios. So on a bunch of biblical stories, we have a whole lot of things over here that came out with higher numbers. Notice over here, almost all, with the exception of one, almost all of these are way down here low in talking about finite verbs of the preterites. You don't see, as we showed you on the bar chat, chart, um, some don't have hardly any preterite verbs. So they're very low in counting the preterite verbs. Others have a lot of preterite verbs. If they have a lot of preterite verbs, it's historical. So he put them over here. Then he averaged, what's the average, counting them all up mathematically, then he just divided to get the average. The average for a historical narrative of what he did was 52%. And you can see that line right here. There's the median line. So 52% is average for historical narrative. He did the same thing with the poetic section. He added them all up, um, did a little dividing here to get an average, and you can see it comes out to 0 0.04 for preterite verbs. Preterite verbs are hardly ever used in historical narrative, in other words. It's less than 4% of the verbs you're ever to come across in a uh, poetic story that's gonna be preterite verb. 4% on the average where in a historical thing, 52% of your verbs are gonna be preterite verbs. So that's what that is showing. So he uses the square, um, the squares here for those, and he uses diamonds. He just started F by putting it on here. He made them into diamonds to make it a little bit easier to understand. Now our question is, where does Genesis fit? Genesis was the last one that he put in here and look where it fits. So it's the last one of the historical ones that he did. It sat right here. Look at the number. It's over 66%, roughly. 66% of the verbs found in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, 56% of the verbs are preterite verbs. You don't see hardly any of the perfects. Right here, we're seeing statistical analysis. The Genesis account is a historical story. He also took the meaning and the middle value of each group for historical narratives. Like I say, he did the averages, 52% versus 
4%. That's what he did, and we saw, saw that with the lines here. That's what that's showing. He gives you the average. The average, and you can see the Genesis account is way above average. Thus, the higher above average you go, the more historical you can count that this is. That's what that's talking about. Using this data, one can examine then a biblical passage. You can take any biblical passage you want, figure out what the verb is, count it up, do the ratio, apply it to the chart, and voila, you can figure it out. The Jews automatically just learned to do this as children sitting in synagogues and in schools learning how to read. And they caught this stuff, and they were taught this stuff, and that's how it was worked on. And that's how they are able to distinguish so easily. Well, he's actually spelling it all out in written form to help you understand it. That's why charts like this are so interesting. And like I say, the Genesis account is at 65%. 65%. That is extremely high. So there's our Genesis account using the chart itself. It's way up here. Like I say, don't let that it's sitting over here, not over here. It's just he did these in a numerical sequence. And it was like the last, this is where he did it. In counting all these stories, he put it in here. And it, he just, right there is where it sits. Now, with this analytical, analytical pattern, Dr. Boyd carefully examined the Genesis account doing this. He set it at 65%, as you can see. That is extremely high. Anything over 52, you're talking historical. Scientific evidence, without a doubt, Genesis account is historical narrative. It is not to be taken as a poetical allegory story. You don't have to use doctrine for this one. This is using scientific analysis. That's an amazing chart. Okay, let's take it to another level. You notice that there's a single diamond at uh, 18% down here. Okay, what is that one? That's when Moses sees God's glory. That's Exodus 33. It doesn't have many. But it's still, I mean, it's way long, far a distance here between the median, but it is down here. Even so, it's placed over here on, the, on that side because there's still not that many of the other verbs in it. Um, the use of the wa perfect verbs in that passage was very high, and that's why it's, it appears a little differently. But still, that doesn't influence the overall story here whatsoever. That's what that's showing. Uh, now, not terminating the study. This guy loves statistics. He takes these 97 passages in his paper, and he does another type of statistical analysis that we call longist, longistic uh, regression. If you've studied s statistics, you know this. If not, let me just briefly tell you, it's another way of plotting things out. What it is, as we do this one, LR, which is what it's often referred to, in making predictions. It's, make, it's how you're going to take your data and make a prediction on what you think your, con you know, your, your study is going to be. So it's making predictions. And in this, only two choices are possible. It's either going to be historical or it's going to be poetic. You only have two, two ways to go, so the math is going to put you very easily into one of these two areas. This is fascinating. It predicts probability of an unknown text. So now you can take any text in the Bible, sit down and use LR, and it will tell you basically the probability of this being historical or allegory simply by the use of these verbs. Here we go. They use a different type of graph for this. Let me explain the graph. Here's the ratio down here at the bottom of the preterite verbs, how often they appear. Over here, we have the narrative probability. Um, so narrative is, is going up this way. Narrative probability, historical probability is what we're talking about. So that this is, now if it falls into this section here where you see this graph going up like this, this means that it's poetry. If it goes beyond 50%, then you're in the other column and you're in the, um, the narrative. Basically, this is talking about history. So this is the historical section. Over in here, this section here is historical. This is poetry. Now, remember, those 97 passages on the graph before, there was a whole lot that sat down here at 4%. That's where they're sitting. The other ones, he started putting up here and counting the ratio. Remember, Genesis was 65. So we go over here to point, uh, 0 0.6. We go halfway, 6.5. Go up. Well, there's a nice line here. Go up, and there it is right there. There's the Genesis account. 
So what does this show us? The higher up you go in this direction, the higher up, the closer you get to seven, the more accurate it is. But you can see how high also it is to the number one. Number one's the highest probability you can have. And look how high Genesis is up here on this chart. It's at the top. As a matter of fact, mathematically, he gives us the number. What's the percentage of this being probable that it's historical? Is 99.9972604%. That's pretty accurate. That's pretty well saying Genesis Chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, 3 is a historical event. What's the probability of that? And someone wants to ask you, what's the probability of the Genesis account being historical? Well, now you can tell them. It's 99.9972604% that it's historical. Doesn't that blow your mind? If the math didn't and the <laughs> statistics didn't. But that's just absolutely amazing to me. That's what this is showing. This beautiful graph here, it's in color to let you see it from a paper that you can download from the Internet. This one has color to it. And you can see where this sits, how close Genesis is up there into this thing. This is absolutely amazing. Logistic regression, LR, identified uh, the genres of text. The value of zero at the bottom means it's poetic. You get to the top at one, your narrative. That's what this whole thing is about. We're comparing the two texts, whether they're historical or narrative. And this is showing Genesis is way up here. It's historical. There's no question about it. Deborah's song, uh, Miriam's song, down here. They're not. They're songs. They're poetry. So LR results, there you are. There's your percentage of Genesis being historical narrative. There's your answer. Now, we can say this, but let's get some experts also, besides Dr. Boyd, who talk about this. Besides Dr. Boyd's research, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Meyer Sternberg, Tel Aviv University. He published a paper back in 1985 called, I love the title of this, The Poetics of Biblical Narrative, The Ideological Literature and the Drama of Reading. I'll wait for the Reader's Digest version to come out. <laughs> but anyway, this is what he wrote. Dr. Meyer states three features that add to this fact that I'm adding him into this account. And he states, too, the Genesis account, uh, the facts that the Genesis account is not poetic, but it is historical. He's saying it is a historical thing. And he uses this detail. He does, um, says, not only does the statistics show this, but remember I told you that there's certain things that you see in historical texts at the beginning of this session? One was genealogies. He says there's genealogies in Genesis 1 through 11. Genealogies are not usually put in poetry, where this begat that, this begat that. That's usually not there. But Genesis has that. That shows that it's historical. Number two, people are described in terms of their past history. In poetry, seldom does this happen. In Genesis 1 from 11, you're getting the history of different people and not just naming names all the time, but often giving the events that they did. That's historical fact. So that's the second thing. And third, throughout the Bible, these events are reviewed. Other writers pick up the stories and, and talk about them. Jesus talked about Jonah. He talked about Abraham. He talked about Elijah. Paul talked about different people. You, you see these things being used over and over. These events are reviewed and they're summarized always in the historical sense. When Jesus was comparing his life and, and death and the resurrection with Jonah, it wasn't Jonah as being a song that some person wearing a little flower outfit dancing around the tambourine wrote. He's talking about a historical event. And it fits. He was going to be in the whale, or what? No, actually, it probably wasn't a whale. Um, I believe it was a great fish. He was in a big fish for three days and three nights, according to the Hebrew time scale. Jesus, too, is in the grave three days and three nights. He's referring to this as a historical event. Because these are used as historical events in stories used later on by biblical characters, that means they are historical events. So to wrap this up, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, passages have a major role in theology and doctrine. We saw that in the session we just did before. It's very important in doctrine and theology. Number two, if it is a metaphor, in other words, if this 
passage is just a poetic story, a fairy tale that we can pull a moral from or something. The whole foundational doctrines of Christianity, our faith, our reliance upon a Christ's blood redeeming us and saving us from the curse of death as the result is in totally crumbles apart. Third, science itself and mathematics has given us major clues that the Genesis account is indeed historical narrative. The probability is virtually one. 99.99%, that's pretty close to one. The field of statistics implies great evidence to be historical. And finally, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 needs to be read as a narrative, not only because of its literary structure, but because all of biblical theology is based on it, as we just had in the previous session. There is your evidence that the Genesis account is real, scientific, doctrinally, statistically. I've shown that now as proof for you. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of being able to share this. And I pray that, Lord, uh, though I've probably fumbled some of this and made this confusing, I pray that your Holy Spirit will just clear it up in our minds and that this will be ammunition that we can add and we can talk to people about, that it does make a difference. This, uh, the whole process of why Jesus had to come and die is based upon what took place in Genesis uh, chapter 3. That's the reason that Jesus had to come. That's where the first messianic prophecy actually is showing. It, it all ties together. And Lord, forgive us for when we don't understand this and we don't study it. And I pray that more people grow up from drinking milk on their scriptures and get into the meat and study this and see the, the serious implications of this. And I thank you for each one that is listening to this right now and ask that you give them a special blessing in Jesus' name and for your glory and honor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that content, you can find more like it on our channel and on our website. You can also book us and get the live experience, which in my opinion is even better. But who knows, I'm a little biased. You can also help us keep this content free by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel or our other social links. You can also help support this ministry by donating online through our website or in the link down in the description. And on that note, may the Lord be with you and we'll see you on the next video.